Thank you. Okay, cool. Well, let's get started. Um, it is April 26, 2021, and it's 4.02 p.m. Can I get, or I'll do a roll call of commission members present. Obviously, Linda's here. Uh, Howard Tritz. Uh, Steve Boyle. Steve Boyle here. Abby Dahlman. Here. Bryce Ehrlich. Here. Uh, Aaron Palin. Here. And Lupi Bobodela. Here. Thank you. And county commissioners, uh, do we have Commissioner Munch? Okay, Commissioner Marcella. Here. And then Commissioner Fiedler. Okay. Um, do we have any changes or additions to the agenda tonight? Anybody know of any? I don't know of any. Um, I know that Christy Galarza is here. Uh, she just mentioned that uh, if we would like a housing update, she is here. So Christy, if you wanna go ahead and I think we can fit that in. So that's not a problem. If you have anything updated you wanna share with us. Thank you, Heather. Thank you, commissioners. I just wanted to pop by and see if anybody had any questions. Um, the policy advisory team is going to be meeting again next week. Um, and they'll be doing a debrief from their presentation and then be ready to come back to you guys. Um, the first meeting of deed restriction went really well. I'm finishing up the notes and we'll be sending out the recording, the notes, um, some post work and the calendar invite hopefully tomorrow. Um, and so that's my really short housing update. Does anybody have any questions? I just wanted to thank you guys all for um, for attending and you know sending me your questions and um, I'm always available. Don't hesitate to reach out. Thank you, Heather. Thank you, Christy. Okay. And we don't have any other updates, so we'll skip right on down. Um, sorry, I have three screens going on at once here. Um, oh, so Heather, I have one quick oh, yeah. thing. Hey, I'm sorry. Sorry for being late. Um, and to, uh, just a quick reminder to anyone, uh, everyone, um, if you have any edits or comments about the recommendation that I sent out last week, um, I'm going to get ready to put it on the agenda to take it to the board on Monday. So if you have anything, if you could be so kind as to get it to me by Wednesday, that would be great. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Ann. Okay, that'll uh, tie us down to old business and we have the review of the backcountry zoning questionnaire. So um, a bunch of us filled it out as, as PC, we filled it out kind of in the meeting. So um, just if anybody had updates to that, uh, we asked that they send those out and then we had the commissioners respond um, as well. And I'm just gonna share, I just tried to come, compile all of them under the appropriate questions. So I will switch share screens here. Um, everybody see that okay? Okay, cool. Uh, so the first question on the sheet was just if you understood the backcountry zoning intentions and if there was any information or any uh, data that we needed to help provide um, to get people on board, but I didn't receive any, all of the feedback. No, nobody really had a concern about why we're doing backcountry and what the um, intentions are for that. So unless anybody has anything on that, I'll skip to the next one. Um, next question was on the boundaries. Um, and the big thing we talked about before in a previous meeting was in regards, to, I, I think, Overall, the question is, do the boundary definitions make sense? I think the, um, sorry, my cat is joining the meeting. Um, there was a big question about the Highway 91 parcels. There's a few parcels there that have, um, are pretty close to the road. And I think there was some going back and forth. I think, um, uh, if I remember correctly, Ben Dodge with the, hut system was at that meeting when we started talking about that a little bit and he's like we own actually a good handful of those um 
But um, here were some of the responses on that. So uh, Commissioner Fiedler had said, you know, there should be minimum, perhaps a minimum distance off the state or county road to really be BC. Um, you know, it's the idea is that it's backcountry, not super accessible from highways. So some of those parcels along 91 looked close. Um, Commissioner Marcella kind of said the same kind of thing. Um, too close to the highway, maybe we need to push them off a little bit from that scenic area. Um, and then Lupe kind of had the same thing. So, uh, and then I, I kind of just inserted my thoughts on that too, that I, I could go either way with it. I don't think anybody's super attached to those specific parcels. I know that Bryce, you could probably speak a little bit more to this as to whether or not we are worried about the mapping um, component to, as far as like creating the, the legal descriptions. I think that was part of the reason we just had it cross 91 there, but to take it out, was there gonna be, uh, I guess, was there gonna be issues with that or what your thoughts were on that? No, I really don't see any issues on that. Um, I was just going kind of based on what had been done before, which is following standard township and section lines and going with that method. But if we wanna kind of create an exception for the highway and a standardized buffer, that's totally doable on the maps. And then to those par particular parcels on Highway 91, just wanna comment that I think besides the one that the White Mountain Snowmobile Tours are on, none of those parcels that are in that zone or were identified in those zone are accessible by the highway. Um, right. Kind of made, that was one standard I had where they're former mining claims, but weren't, there's some former mining claims that do have highway access. So I didn't include those. And um, the terrain is such that, I mean, going to Highway 91 is pretty steep. So especially on the, that would be west side, a lot of those huts would be accessed from the top of the mountain, top of Mount Zion, kind of like the hut is. Um, just for consideration of those particular ones around 91. I'm not attached to them at all though. Um, but yeah, mapping shouldn't be a problem no matter what you guys want to do. Does anybody else have some thought? Like my kind of thought here was if we could go through each of these and kind of come up with what we think the PC's recommendation is to mitigate each one of these. Um, I would make the notes down below. And then that way this document can live and be shared with those who couldn't make it tonight as well. Um, so if we can kind of get some feedback from folks on this issue, then I'll kind of create a uh, resolution note here down below it, if I can edit this at the same time. I, think I, I mean, I'll just chime in since I was one of the uh, people making that comment. I mean, if um, given what I just heard, that alleviates a ton of my concern, because I think maybe I was just, I think we spent a fair amount of time looking at that map you know, of parcels along 91. So I think I, I thought it was more parcels and especially that comment about how the action, even though they're close to 91, the actual access is that longer route up from Zion. I mean, it it's, I, I, I'm pretty satisfied it's not a big deal and we don't need to like go to great lengths to create more complicated legal descriptions. If it's just a, if, if it's just a few or almost like one or no parcels in reality. So I don't think it's a big deal. Any other thoughts? Could um, swim towards not including those parcels is just knowing that, um, you know, when you're pushing this information out, potentially when uh, seeking approval, that it could be confusing for the public um, potentially to understand like why there's just a few parcels that are hitting on a major road. Um, so, so yeah, I mean, I think you just make the, you make the rule, you know, kind of how, um, how you lay out, um, the zoning now or, or just make sure that anything touching any of those roads is, is not included. I feel like there was some maybe close to 82 as well, but I don't have the map right in front of me. There were some, there's some mining claims on 82 that do touch the highway proper. So I kind of excluded those portions. Um, basically, and same with 91 is that none of the parcels touch the highway. Um, I think one, maybe just for, I, I think that's a good point, Abby, about like when this goes to public, we might be getting feedback. 
on this particular part. It might be just for visualization and clarification to put the Highway 91 right of way through because right now I think that's causing confusion that the zoning district crosses over the highway there. Um, yep. So just some sort of delineation there might really eliminate a lot of confusion. Yeah, that makes sense. Any other thoughts or suggestions on that? I like that idea a lot, Bryce, I think. Regardless of what we do, if we take that, if we take the highway out of the out of the block of color, that changes, you know, the perception a lot, but a lot more. Again, I could go either way on this. I'm not. I feel like we're talking about such few properties affected by it that um, I, I guess I don't. I would just want it to be easy. So if we feel like it's going to be easier for staff to. Um, and us in order as far as public uh, perception to just take those out and then let if any of those want to be included in it, they can be, um, they can apply for a, a zone change and include themselves into it. Um, that kind of seems like an easy route as long as the logistics of that legal description creation isn't that big of a deal for that section. So whatever, how are people feeling? Kind of go with that, that plan of attack, just leave those pieces out or keep it, but delineate the highway out of it to clear up what's, what, it, what would people, if you had to choose one, let me know what you'd think. Would we be doing the same with the highway 82 corridor as well? We could. Well, if we do it for one, we should do it for the other as well. I'm personally in favor and I think the legal description would be relatively straightforward to just exclude the right of ways. And then it makes it clear, but you know, cause it doesn't open the can of worms of what properties we should be excluding um, when we go down I'm, that road. I'm really quite good with that. Yeah, I like that. How does everybody else feel about that? Any concerns or? I like it. Uh, the, if the public can understand that, I think that'll help the building department uh, demonstrate the case to the public. So I, I think that would be a, a real life changer for, for uh, the building department to be able to explain it to the public and the public would understand better. Yeah, I think that's great. Um, we can work on that. Okay. Good there. Any other thoughts before I move to the next one? Good. Okay. The next one is gray water. <laughs> Super fun one. Um, okay. So there were several comments in here on the gray water stuff. Um, you know, we've talked a lot about this, obviously, again, coming back to wanting to make sure that staff um, both our staff as well as public health staff can manage um, requests coming through on this. We wanna make sure that there's definitely some clarity on what we're doing with sanitation services. So the first um, response was from Paul, um, just kind of saying that the PC isn't a part of the gray water um, planning that needs to be environmental health. Um, he had some good points in here about that most of the backcountry users are likely going to be um, applying for an outhouse um, or have to do the full system because um, they're either going to want the kitchens. I think most of them I would agree with are going to end up wanting a kitchen. And once you're at, ki at a kitchen, you're at Blackwater. So you've got to do some sort of um, septic system for that or a Blackwater system anyway. Um, so I feel like the number of people who are actually going to want a gray water only system are, are pretty limited, but um, nevertheless, uh, this is just kind of saying that those would all be administered um, 
through environmental health department um, and you know adopting that code that gray water plan uh, down the road um, Bryce uh, kind of had a uh, same idea that PCs, not in PC purview, but would strongly recommend that the county streamline any variance process um, that will be necessary, including defining our own regulations. And um, yeah, I mean, I think whatever is determined, it needs to be pretty clear exactly what the process is for folks um, when they're building. And quite honestly, probably it needs to be clear now anyway, whether it's backcountry zoning or not, right? There needs to be, because people are building up on these kinds of properties anyway right now. I think that's why there's some issue with variances. Um, so we'll probably want to make sure that uh, we have a very clear, um, infer very clear information that we're giving out to people um, in regards to those. Um, Commissioner Fiedler's kind of said the same thing. Um, variances aren't obviously the, the most desired way to move forward, um, but need to resolve the gray water plan. Um, Commissioner Marcella, same kind of thing, um, governed by two different, I uh, wanna make sure the application is processed and noticed to people that they don't have an automatic in with a variance. Like they're not gonna be automatically granted a variance based on whatever they're doing. They have to know that it has to meet certain criteria. Um, Lupe, um, very similar. Everybody's comments pretty similar here. Um, Commissioner Mudge, uh, I was a little unclear on exactly what the notes meant here, but it was, um, uh, I think that she's saying here that um, we have to outline what the options are for folks in the procedure to approve them, um, that they're not assumed to be approved and that these are kind of the different options for folks um, that we would need to, to give. Um, and then my notes were just that I kind of echo Paul's thoughts that I don't, I don't have a lot um, of additional to add to that. So what are people's thoughts further about gray water? I can, I can go on this, Heather, if you want me to start. No, that'd be great. All right. Um, I think gray water is very, um, very complex, and I don't think that there's a whole lot of uh, easily accessible educational tools out there to um, help applicants understand the difference between gray water and black water. Um, because I think, you know, if you just assume what a gray water reg is, you would think, you know, things like dish water, soapy hand water, those types of things. Um, but a lot of those fall into the black water systems, which is the reg 43. And so I, um, I think that's something that the, the planning commission will wanna help environmental health with to understand where the overlap is. But I don't necessarily know that, um, gray water regs is a hindrance for for the the zoning um for backcountry zoning i don't know if it's something that we should say oh we shouldn't pass this until we have gray water regulations because gray water is such a small piece that i don't know it will if it'll have that much impact thank you kayla uh any other uh thoughts on that Uh, I think that Kayla's mentioning that um, gray water is such a small issue in the backcountry zoning issues as a whole, um, I would agree with. And um, in addition to the thoughts that most of all of the rest of us seem to have had, we seem to agree that let's let gray water and black water do whatever it does through environmental health and leave it on environmental health plate because largely that's going to come down from CDPHE anyway. Is there uh, to assist in that and to make things very transparent and very clear to our folks, is there a... Um, 
Is there something that you feel like anybody feels like we could put together that would be informative that would say, hey, here's just a little bit of information you need to go to environmental health to get the resources on this. Is there a need for us to do that? Kind of what are, what's the thought on, do we need to, or what could, what could we perhaps, I guess, put in front of people to make it possible for them to, you know, have a little bit more understanding of this, of, you know, the procedure and such. Anybody have I, thoughts on that? I, I think, I don't absolutely know this, but I think that it's CDPHE that dictates that there be a variance procedure for anything other than a standard OWTS. And they dictate how that uh, variance is handled. So um, that there is a procedure that the Environmental Health Department has to go through in order for the Board of Health to grant or not grant a variance. Um, and also, I think to just kind of further the fluidness of this and to assist um, the citizens um, in just administering this code and having informational um, support in the department in building and land use, as we administer this eventually, we could potentially point to a standard that says that you need to have this coordination so that there's some early consideration at pre-out meetings, as well as um, you know, providing um, informal outside of the code information within um, the supportive role that building and land use provides to all applicants of any land use or building process. So um, it may live a little bit outside of the actual code language, but I think that we could have um, you know, a, a quick and easy fact sheet for people that are inquiring about this. We can look for ways to partner with public health like we currently do on um, like the application for building permits. So currently we, we have a, a spreadsheet sharing um, platform so that we can help um, identify where people are in the process. And so I think there's a lot of things that can happen kind of um, procedural um, within our office in the administrative part that, that will be outside the actual code, but um, we certainly can make a standard that points to identifying this a need at the pre-application meeting so it can live in the use specific standards of a backcountry build. Um, so I can look at trying to add something there. And then also the assurance that we could um, propose a method by which we um, look to help inform and support, support public health through this and inform the public. You said so many great things and I just couldn't tap, type that fast. So I'll have to have you add to this later, but those, thank you. I like it. I just like the idea of, the, you know, you're pointing someone and it's not just gonna be, you know, it's not gonna confuse people. Um, you'll have a process laid out. I think that makes sense. I tend to think that it's fairly important that there be a variance procedure for something as serious as waste disposal. That I think that a, an applicant or applicants should understand that this is a serious topic and that um, there's no, no easy way to handle it. So I think that, I, I think there's something good about the variance process. Uh, environmental health issues the OWTS permits, they should also be effectively issuing any other kind of waste permit. Thanks, Paul. Any other thoughts? Does this thing seem to kind of like... Um, take care of a lot of, you know, kind of the concerns and move forward. Obviously, if we fluff this up a little bit more with Anne's thoughts that she expressed, does that seem to fit what everybody's thoughts were on that? I think I'd, I'd like to echo Anne's um, uh, thoughts on this, that we have 
several procedures that we use that aren't codified um, within ourselves and with our within our referral agencies as well as within uh, between it within and between environmental health and this would just be another one okay next one was wildfire um and i think the last time we all talked we had had the or ann and sarah had had the conversations for service um and then there was also a um advisement to contact Parks and Rec, which later I know Paul had a question as to who Parks and Rec, but I think we were talking about the state, maybe, but I don't, anyway, for feedback to make sure there's nothing else we haven't considered. Um, and then most everybody here is kind of talking about defensible space. Um, you know, Commissioner Fiedler brought up a question about, um, and I don't know this acronym, um, so that would be helpful. And then, um, I am, I don't know anything about the fire smart code. So I'm interested to learn about that. Um, but it sounds like, you know, everybody here is kind of saying, hey, we want to make sure that we are providing people with um, recommendations for defensible space and things like that. And what should be required, what should be recommended. Um, and if there was any additional agencies we should be reaching out to. Uh, I'd like to say that the idea of dispensable space is typically to be able to protect a structure from a wildland fire. I think in this case, what we want to do is protect the wildland from a structure fire. Yeah. I agree. And I don't know, you know, I, I don't know how, oh, sorry, go ahead, Steve. Oh, this is Bryce, but it just came to me as okay. in regards to Paul's point, if we're more worried about the structures causing the wildfire, could we put in something, some sort of like, do they have like ember catches for the top of um, stove chimneys? I'm not sure if those exist. I was just thinking about that, but that is a good point. I think, Bryce, know. that's a really good point. Spark arrester is what that there, is. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and I guess are those are I know that I've heard of other counties that require them on all of their we don't have do we not have that requirement on our wood stoves on everything. Uh, not in the building department. Okay. So maybe we could I mean that's definitely that's a great point. I don't even know if that's how you spell it. It would be on all wood, right? Or would it also be on pellet and stuff? I guess I don't know. I don't know what you'd say there, but. On all wood fired heat heating devices. or wood burning. Um, and Heather, I think what I was trying to get at with my comment was, I, I typed in the chat the name of the State Department, but I think oh. maybe, I mean, maybe the broader point actually is with the, with the um, sort of updating of the Community Wildfire Protection Plan. I, I don't know if this makes sense, but I mean, if there are areas of this new backcountry zone that, sort of come out of that prioritization, you know, mapping effort. I mean, I, I, I mean, maybe just everything in the back country needs to have a certain level of controls, but I, I could see some of these zones, some of the parcels in this back country zone being in sort of the highest tier priority um, out of that community plan. And we might, I mean, maybe it just gets dealt with this the actions coming out of that plan, but I could I could imagine there being some stricter controls in the highest risk 
tier from that mapping. Yeah. Is, is there, does it work at all where, um, and I guess I don't know how like the fire restrictions get put into place, but is it, um, could you potentially have a stronger fire restriction in like a zone district instead of the, or like a certain area? Like if, if the dryness or the climate changes enough to where somebody's like, yeah, that higher elevated high risk wildfire area needs to have more restriction. Like, is that a, I has, guess that's has, how that works. Hi, Heather. This is Brian Sipes. Has the county adopted all of the international codes? Because there is a code called the International Wildland Urban Interface Code. Yeah. It deals with everything you're talking about. It requires spark arresters, requires defensible space. I believe upon its adoption, you can define where it is in force and where it is not. But um, I guess the point is, is all of this has been thought about before. There's an actual building code that addresses it. Yeah, so, that, Paul, that's I right. I don't know. If... It's the WUI, the Wildland yeah. Urban Interface. Yeah. Yep. And we've been talking about that with the fire department for six years now. So, okay. Um, I just want to um, kind of also point out what the current draft code says. So with the help of the um, Forest Service, we put in additional, when we talked, to tree, talked about tree removal, we have in here consult, um, consultation with a fire professional is advised to help determine tree and fuel risk associated with backcountry locations and structures. So that's under tree removal and then under fire mitigation. The current standard is all development shall comply with the, live, uh, the Lake County Fire Rescue Fire Hazard Mitigation Requirements. So we do, I just want to at least mention what the, what the draft has uh, present in it currently. Well, and also the reason I brought that up is there's a couple of things in the WUI that um, you haven't talked about, at least that I don't know. And that is, uh, there's some guidelines about where you can cite your um, propane tanks, and there's guidelines in there about storage of firewood and combustible materials. There's, there's a bunch of good stuff in there that helps in those situations, I think. So is that something that we could, even though we're not necessarily adopting that countywide yet, and that's still in conversations, perhaps something that we could do with that is um, pull pull any regulations out of there that we want to um, apply specifically to the backcountry. It's just that I think that what I worry about a little bit is the idea here is to create the zoning code and not the building code. Um, and I think that we have to be really careful to not address building code in the land development code because the building code can change so frequently and we don't want to um, create a document that's dependable or uh, that in, ends up being in conflict with another one. So yeah, you don't um, want to duplicate it I think either. we have to be careful that's... with what we're, what we're doing. So we'd want to make sure that, I guess part of this idea here is what haven't we thought about um, as far as wildfire protection for the code that we're writing, but then also are there other areas within the county that we need to focus on such as building code or what have you to address other issues, so. I think you're dead on correct, Heather, and I think that's why I brought it up is to the extent that you can reference out to other documents and leave it out of the land use code, you're probably better off. Mm -hmm. well, uh, as for your question, Heather, um, yes, you can uh, chicken pluck certain things from other codes to uh, to put into the zoning code. And you can do this with one whole zone district. And I would say that the uh, backcountry zone district is probably going to become the very wildland urban interface um, when this is all said and done. Right, and I would also just you know be hesitant about, again, looking to um, adopt other um, plans in preparation for this, just like we've been talking about gray water. Um, so um, yeah, any opportunities that we have to be um, intentional right now and, and hope that um, eventually those others may come to fruition, but I think that might be also helpful. 
And I just had a quick note about the actual work we're doing on the community wildfire protection plan. Um, we don't really have like a defined WUI right now, like that meets a bunch of standards. So that's one of the things that we're working on. As soon as we have this survey data meeting this next week about kind of the next step in that mapping process and what our WUI is considering our particular assets in the county. So I think we'll have a better idea of that, but yeah, maybe if we could avoid that, you know, pointing to it specifically. And then my other um, point was just to bring up Jeff's point about the private landowners being in wildfire risk zones. Um, one thing that KP County has been able to do and maybe we could make it or try to compel or incentivize private landowners to do this is that Chafee County as part of their CWPP has a private landowner program that specifically is there to fund fire mitigation on private pieces of land. So <clears throat> I'm not sure exactly the funding mechanism that's there, but I know we could find our own funding mechanism, but maybe if that's something we could build in for these high risk private lands is like, hey, well, there's money already here. This is going to eliminate your or lower your burden to building or something like some sort of incentive using that um, program that's already there. Heather, your point of mixing our codes in with each other um, is well taken. Um, it does happen. I think it will happen, but it's, it's a very good point that we probably want to at least pay attention to. Um, so what are people's thoughts as far as our proposed resolution here? I mean, I think that um, I'm, you know, I'm excited to hear that there's progress being made on that. And um, I like the idea of pointing to that um, in our, you know, in, in this zoning code. Um, What's and the of, be a part of that conversation or... Sorry, go ahead. Oh, no, I was just going to, the likelihood of us adopting um, that wildland urban interface, IBC. So an, an easy way to address that now is when we say that it has to be compliant with the, um, by the Lake County Fire Hazard Mitigation Plan and any future adopted plans. So we could um, just you know, clean it all up and, and, and point to what might happen in the future. So that's, that's kind of a quick and easy way to be inclusive about it. These um, individually will also be referred to the fire department. Um, all, every, all the applications? So Heather, can I chime in for a second? Uh, yes, all other sure, applications. Yeah. Go ahead, Steve. Um, I agree with, uh, Paul beat me to the punch on it, but uh, from the fire department standpoint, to be really quick about it, we can put a mitigation plan in there as the standards for defensible space. So it did something in there landscape wise and recommendations and distancing, uh, like the other gentleman said, I, I just forgot his name, on how to keep a house from being a creator of a wildfire with some standards on that, that doesn't conflict or uh, create a problem with uh, with building code. Uh, fire department's uh, interest and in, uh, in code enforcement would be on the outside or in the envelope of the house itself or cabin, but not the cabin itself. So we wouldn't be in conflict with the building department. Yeah, we, so are refer, you... we refer every building permit to the fire department anyway. And that, that's extremely helpful because on all the permits that I put out for the residentials on new construction is to recommend at this time to mitigate their properties, but uh, working uh, with, with Chief Daly on the uh, mitigation uh, and the CWPP on putting those, those standards in there. So it's not really a building code, but it's a set standard for insurance purposes and keeping wildfire from, from affecting the house or the house affecting into uh, a wildfire uh, problem. So um, I just want to make sure I'm capturing things. Um, so kind of our resolution, we know that there's a wildfire protection plan in the works. 
super supportive of that. Um, point to the required um, compliance um, with any county plans and building codes um, will just be part of our code, right? We'll just, as far as the, the way it reads. And then all building permits are referred to the fire department. Um, and I think, and I'm sorry, Ann, remind me, uh, the way we have the, the district set up right now, it, it does already recommend a defensible space and meeting with the fire. Okay. Right. Yep. The, the code already has um, comment on uh, tree removal and defensible space from the Forest Service and then um, compliance with the uh, and review by the local Lake County Fire Rescue. Oh, and, and we could just point to, you know, just change that sentence and to any future plans adopted. Any other thoughts or questions on that? Does that kind of look good to everybody? Okay. I like it. All right, the next question was, um, it had come up once or twice about whether or not it could change the impact on our tax base. Um, just to recap a little bit as to why this is a question. Um, vacant land right now um, is taxed at the 29% rate. So they take 29% of your value and they multiply that by the mill levies and create your, your tax, your property tax. Whereas residential, once you have a residential structure on it, it drops down to, I don't know, it's just under 8%, I think, of that value instead of, instead of uh, 29%. So there was some question about, oh, well, are we going to lose tax space? But I think what happens is you're changing the value, right? So you have a vacant piece of land, but then you have a land, you have land with a house on it suddenly. So I, th I think a lot of times you're gonna end up just washing out um, as far as that goes. Um, but here were some of the, the res responses. I think, you know, Paul kind of said he's not an assessor so we can reach out to them. Um, and uh, Commissioner Fiedler asked if we talk to the assessor, which I have. Um, and then Commissioner Marcella echoed those same thoughts, um, similarly to what I just said, um, that a lot of times that improvements on the land offset that change in value. Um, deferring to the assessor. I did have a, um, a phone conversation with Miguel um, on this topic. Um, there were lots of other things we discussed too, but um, I did ask him what his thoughts are on this. And he said, you know, it's really, it's gonna be really hard to say that, but his guess is that it would be a wash also. Um, it wouldn't likely be a decrease um, in those be just simply because if if you're adding something to it, your value increases so significantly that it would probably increase. So that was kind of, I didn't get any kind of formal response from him at all. So I don't want to say that, but I did have that conversation with him. Um, didn't seem like uh, something that I would, I, I didn't gauge, nor did I gauge from these comments here that anybody thought this was some sort of really big um, issue to address here, but happy to um, hear anybody's thoughts. You know, I've only just, I do this every once in a while, they call it a brain fart. Um, I, I wonder if a backcountry cabin that doesn't really have a kitchen, that doesn't have plumbing, doesn't have a source of a permanent source of water, is that a residence? And would the assessor consider it to not be or actually be a residence? If somebody is going to get a permit to for a uh, um, a pit privy, um, they're not going to be allowed to occupy it more than 180 days out of the year. So historically, um, I, I mean, because these do exist right now, I mean, maybe not the under 600 square feet part, but these do exist where we've got a few people with backcountry 
um, properties that have um, a pit privy uh, and they are currently being taxed residential um, for the most part. And Howard, actually, our previous assessor might have more to say about that. Well, thank you. Um, I had difficulties getting signed in here again today. Sorry, I was a little late. Anyway, um, yeah, you know, historically a, a house is residential. People live in the house, they stay in the house, they sleep in the house, they have bedrooms, they have closets. I mean, it's, it's a residence. Uh, it's, and historically through the years, uh, even around town, wherever some places where there is a higher, much higher value on, on the uh, land than, than other places, uh, historically, it's it has been washed. It's been more actually more than washed. It's been it's, they've usually increased in value because the house value or cabin value has uh, increased over the land value, and it makes sense because people people pay a lot of money to get these uh, vacation uh, 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 backcountry homes because they all want one. So they'll, they'll raise the price on them. So that's my two cents. Um, so I'm kind of hearing from people that they're not, you know, based on the comments and things that nobody's super concerned about this. Is this just a response of, hey, PC doesn't see this as a likely issue or concern? Seems that way to me. Okay. Uh, this was on the grade of 30%. Um, and Paul said building department requires engineer plans on over 20%. Um, Fiedler said uh, he wanted to make sure, and I was a little confused on this and I just wanted to make sure I wrote this comment in the right section. Um, if we could eliminate some part parcels based on the satellite mapping slope analysis. Um, and I don't know that we were going to do that, but I, don't, I also don't know how it all works with the building department as far as how you guys determine slope. Um, but I don't think you're doing it on a mapping program, but um, so he's recommending he'd like that on a actual rely on a survey for that. And then um, a lot of us said, hey, we don't have any knowledge on this. So um, in up to Paul's point, I didn't, for some reason I thought we came up with 30 because that's what is currently being used. But if 20% is what's currently in the code for everything else, then I don't know why we would increase it to 30. So I would be, I don't have any expertise on that. I was kind of relying on that. So if you guys, Paul and Ann at the building department, if you guys are, are requiring plans of anything over 20%, then I would say that we would just want to match that. I wouldn't want to create any differences in the backcountry district from what we currently require. I thought you just couldn't build at 30%. No, you can build on any oh. anywhere, and um, as as long as it's um, designed well enough. I mean, we just require that uh, engineered plans be submitted to us um, on grades over twenty percent. It doesn't mean it, that you can't build it on a ninety percent grade. It's just it's got to be engineered. But were we propose? I think what Abby is asking is, were we proposing that um, in the backcountry code that anything over thirty couldn't be built on? Which I that's a great question. Could. I don't know what we that. were writing in there because I, I guess I thought that it was more along the lines of this: if it's higher than that, you've got to have pretty specific engineered plans that prove that it's okay to do. But I, th I think Abby's got it right. I think we were. <laughs> read it from the code real quick. So what we have in the in the code draft says, where practical and consistent with other standards of this code, structure shall be cited on the portion of the parcel that has less slope, which shall in no case exceed 30%. So we're saying, if you have something more than 30% grade, you can't build on it at all. 
Correct. The rest of the building code would apply that if you're over 20, you still have to get it engineered. Okay. Yeah, that becomes more of a building code than it be than it is a zoning code. Um, I just think this is one of those cases in which we're going to be mixing the codes. Uh, I don't really have a strong objection to limiting construction on a 30% or 20% grade. I just think this it's a good example here of where we mix building code and uh, zoning code together and I don't really have a strong feeling about it. Well, I would I would just offer that um, this was echoed by like when we had a meeting with the Forest Service and we've talked to some emergency management folks. Um, you know, this this was pretty intentional in looking to um, not allow it in these excessively, you know, or that that thirty greater than 30% is overly excessive given just the nature of these areas. So I would say that, you know, there was quite a bit of vetting on this and, and consulting with um, Forest Service, emergency management. And, um, you know, so this was some consideration that they asked for in the code. And that was their number, right? They were the ones that gave us that 30 degrees in the first place. That's correct. Pretty heavily tied to avalanches, right? Uh, that's exactly right. Everybody feels good about leaving it that way. And I think that this clarification alleviates everybody's questions here. Um, I'm good with that. Commissioner Fiedler, does that kind of address what you were asking about here too? I just want to make sure. Oh, I see still on. I might have lost him. Um, yeah, no, I'm here. Sorry, just uh, my phone had kind of gone into sleep mode, so it took more buttons just to get off mute. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, and I think my question about the mapping was um, just, I mean, I thought there was, we had, when we had the discussion before, Bryce had sort of a slope tool, you know, based on the GIS mapping. And I was just, I mean, I don't know the answer. I was just curious. So I, I, th I think my question, that question about whether the mapping is accurate enough or whether you need a site survey is probably moot given the discussion. Um, but that was my point. I, I just didn't want to be like excluding people based on not super accurate mapping. Yep, I agree. And give, and give people a chance for an actual site survey to make their case. Yeah. Okay, cool, thank you. Heather, um, yeah. Uh, yeah, I go along with uh, Jeff uh, Fiedler's discussion. Um, I don't know if the mapping has improved that much since I was um, in the assessor's office, but back in that day, we couldn't really rely on the mapping grade to be reliable. And I think, uh, uh, boots down is the best way to do it. Uh, building, uh, uh, somebody from the building department is going to insist anyway when they build the house or the cabin that it's going to be on the 20 or the 30 percent. And um, yeah, I wouldn't go by the maps unless, like I said, it's changed a lot in the last uh, six, eight years, and I could have. I do have accurate mapping information for slopes over 30 degrees. <laughs> so it is going to be boots on the ground to, you know, with those 20 to 30 degree gray area properties. Well, we got to clear that up then because this is a 20%, not a 20 degrees. Yeah, that's, we need to clarify that. Oh. Well, so is that what we have? We have it as 20, is it, should it be 20 degrees? I yeah, I just had it written everywhere as a percent, so. Yeah, most of the topography mapping is done in degree, you know, and all the standards of the Forest Service would be 30 degrees because that's kind of the avalanche danger is 30 degrees and above. Okay. I don't know how to make a degree symbol, so I'm just going to write that in there instead. Okay, cool. Uh, anything else on this one? Okay, cool. Um, 
okay, road access, easements, enforcement. Um, this has to do with people trying to figure out their legal roads, um, trails in the backcountry, people building them up, people doing damage to them and such. Um, Paul uh, said that, you know, it would be prudent for us to make sure that we're mentioning in the code that this is intended to keep it back to country. Um, so not, you know, improving those roads necessarily, um, but keep them primitive and access um, improvements are discouraged other than drainage maintenance. Um, Bryce had some good points about whether or not we could do um, or how code enforcement would happen. Um, active uh, prevention and penalization of illegal um, road cabin trail construction um, and defining the current and future access um, for roads and trails. Um, Fiedler along the same lines as far as what is our um, enforcement capacity um, in doing anything about existing structures. And I assume he means kind of along the lines of things that don't necessarily meet the code currently and or need to come in compliance. Um, Boyle uh, responded that the road designations would really help in future projects and ownership. And I think that that was because we had talked about the, um, that somebody was already working on um, identifying, or we were gonna ask, I think, Road Bridge to identify county roads and other county identified public roads. Um, and then Commissioner Mudge was saying no road construction. Um, the first one I was a little confused on just because it says if the parcel is accessible and by a recorded and recognized public road, then you must get explicit acknowledgement and approval of use. But I'm thinking maybe she's saying if it's not one of those, um, then you would have to get explicit acknowledgement and approval of use. Um, county doesn't provide any driveway permitting, um, must seek permitting with appropriate agency for access, um, delivery of material, I'm assuming for building may be necessary by a helicopter, um, and you'll be fined $5,000 if you don't completely plan and permit access for the project. Um, I just put in that I, you know, I wanted to reiterate our conversation that we had with legal a while ago in that, you know, we don't have a current requirement for proof or legal permission to access properties right now to build on. So I think it would be burdensome and possibly sticky to ask that of staff moving forward. Um, I think that although I fully understand and I definitely don't wanna see increased activity or illegal roads created or illegal trails created, I worry that the county themselves are involving themselves in a ci civil matter if they, if they get into, oh, well, these guys, you know, if the county says you have to have legal access and you provide this document that the county staff says, okay, yeah, that looks reasonable and that looks real. And they say, yes. And then you find out later that neighbor Tom says, no, he doesn't have access across my land. I feel like you've just involved the county in a lawsuit because they said they verified legal access. Um, so that, it, that's a big deal for me. I think that um, currently if people access just as far as legality of it all, if people access their property illegally, that's a civil matter between them and the property that they're accessing across. Um, and I don't know how we could mitigate that on the county side of things. So that's, that's where I feel like we're pretty challenged um, to, to do much as far as proving access. Um, but I noted in here, and I kind of mentioned it before too, I would really like there to be, and I don't know if it's like a little backcountry um, disclosure document that we require all applicants to sign acknowledging, and that is here's fire mitigation recommendation, recommendations, here's um, your responsibility to verify legal road access um, and the consequences that could happen if you don't. Um, if we are gonna impose any kind of penalties for damaging county roads um, or public roads, um, damaging or um, unapproved improvements to county roads, um, potential consequences for creating new trails, and roads that may not may or may not be legal, etc. I think that you could just, you know, require each of those 
and there may be more that based on our discussion previously too, that we want to say, hey, um, we want to make sure that every person building in the backcountry has seen this document, they're signing it, and they understand that the burden is on them to make sure that they have legal access and that they understand that there are penalties if they don't um, and such. So that was kind of my suggestion, um, but I wanted to, I think this is a big one that we probably need to open up for discussion. So here we are. Heather, Heather that's a terrific idea. I, well, I think Go ahead. Go, ahead, Go ahead, Paul. Well, I think that um, it's certainly going, if in order to get to a mining claim, for instance, has to go through Forest Service land, the Forest Service is going to require a permit. And, um, and they're not going to want to see much in the way of, of anything other than really backcountry. Um, that it isn't intended to be a road. Um, so I, I think putting the burden on the applicant, uh, and we can tell them, well, you got to cross Forest Service, so you got to get access from the Forest Service. I think part of the discussion that we've had before is if somebody has to cross another mining claim in order to get to their mining claim, that's been rather implied since mining claims were in, in existence. So um, I don't think we'd need to worry about that. But if the driveway that needs to happen to get to a mining claim is across private property that isn't a mining claim, and I know that some of that does actually happen, um, we may need to actually tell them that you need to go get access from this person and from the Forest Service. And I think we can actually require a driveway permit. I do think you change the nature of like the historical use of a mining claim by changing the zoning. So I don't, I don't know if the, like the former precedent of being able to cross necessarily or would continue to apply. Um, just knowing that, you know, you could be crossing in the one place where, you know, another another owner of our minor mining claim may may want to be building their structure. Yeah, I don't know that, I mean, I, I've never heard of where there's an automatic assumption of access through another private owner's mining claim. Um, it was a discussion that I had with Aaron Smith. Oh, okay. There is a, there's one law from like the 1870s that says that a miner has the right to haul his quartz over another mining claim. So that's where it gets really ambiguous and you know what it gets down to legalese where, what does that mean hauling quartz? Does that mean access or does that mean you're allowed to access just for mining activity? But I know where Paul's coming from because I've heard the same argument, you know, and I just think it's, <clears throat> there's a little bit of debate there. So the way to solve that, Heather, is your method. Well, and that's, and that's yeah, what I mean, legal I just, advice does. Yeah. I think Paul had a good point that they're going to have to go over the Forest Service anyway. So I mean, having a direct line of contact to the Forest Service for any driveway issues would be a good place to start. And my whole concern is, I think this is where we're going to have to go, but it's, it's about what's the dis disincentive? What's the penalty for getting caught not following this rule, you know, um, if we're going to well, put it on them, would the, would the disincentive being be sued? Is the disincentive entirely a forest service matter? Um, right. And I think that's the problem is like, I, and that's what I keep going back to is it depends on what property the problem is on, right? If it's the forest service, it's up to the forest service to admit. I, I just like, I, I don't even think the forest service would let us dictate what somebody did on their land. I think they would get involved in that. I think private property, it would be up to the private property owner. Um, and then I think the only other other place that we have any say is, and I think that's why I put on here that it was about county roads, is if it is a county road or a county recognized public road, then I feel like perhaps we could talk about these um, penalties of like, 
hey, if you do damage or you do something to this, right, then the county has say on that because it's, it's a county recognized um, piece. So legally that makes sense to me, but it, it doesn't make sense to me to say, well, legally you have to prove that Joe Smith gave you rights to go over his land and legally you have to not build up that road more than you are, you know what I mean? Like, I think it just gets, it just gets really sticky I don't know how that works, I guess. I'm just saying that like all of it gets really muddy when you start talking about penalties of doing something or enforcement of doing something over, especially for a service land. But we already have in the code somewhere, right? That we require a driveway over for a service land or, or rather we would require a driveway permit from the forest service if it went over their yeah. land. Yeah, and Heather, um, I think you've covered it pretty well in that paragraph. Uh, at this point, it looks great. You know, as time goes on, we may find it needs some uh, dressing up, but it looks really good right now. And, you know, the thing is, most of these are, you know, they're, they're still recreational mining claims, and it shouldn't change their classification, even though they have a cabin on them, I wouldn't think. Um, even though it does become a residential thing. But most of them uh, um, I have a, a semblance of a road going into them because that's what they were up there for. The miners had to get there. Um, a lot of them don't, but uh, I think probably the majority do. And during, I remember years back where the Forest Service wouldn't allow people to go across their property, drive across it. And I know of two, two cabins that were built, one up in uh, Porcupine Gulch and another one up in Empire Gulch where they could drive on a public road to the Forest Service property. Then they had to carry all of their materials in. And, and both people, both guys that I know of did that. And so it's not insurmountable and again, I, I like your paragraph. I, I think it's very good. Um, I have just a couple quick notes. I was just going to say that um, it does seem like the only thing that we can contemplate is what we have jurisdiction over. So only on county roads. And, and I'm wondering if there is an ordinance or a legal basis that already exists that we don't have to reinvent the wheel within this particular code about damage to um, a public right of way or county maintained road. Um, so it, it, staff can certainly look into that and maybe look for county legal um, help on, on seeing if there's already a legal basis um, that has standing or if there's a particular ordinance about that. Um, but again, I think maybe just looking at what we actually have jurisdiction over and maybe not having to um, and relying on, on that legal basis that may already exist. Um, the other thing, uh, Heather, that you were talking about is kind of a code of conduct. Um, and so every building permit that is pulled, we have what's called a, a, a builder's affidavit. We have a specific one for home builders. We have a specific one for contractors. Um, and we certainly can have a, a specific one for uh, backcountry builds. And, um, and it is like a code of conduct that they affirm to and acknowledge by signature. And again, then kind of sets out the parameters and kind of the or, or basic code of conduct for the actual building activity that goes on site. So those two tools might be um, things to kind of help with a couple of these issues. Thank you, Anne. Good points, Anne. Uh, I think the affidavit is probably something we should pursue for a backcountry build. Um, I'm also, um, I, I think Road and Bridge does have the authority uh, that if its road is damaged by an, by, um, an individual, I think they do have the authority to impose a fine. Um, but I don't know that. And that's, that's a road and bridge ish issue and not a zoning issue. Okay.
Okay, so how does that look for folks? Do we do do people agree with that? As far as our look at that cute baby. Oh, now I only see his head. Um, oh there's oh my gosh, look at those eyes. If you ever need a need a babysitter, just let me know. She loves it when I'm on the computer. <laughs> um, how does this proposed resolution sit with everybody? Do you feel like that mitigates your own concerns? Do you have other things you want me to add to it? Does this not mitigate your concerns? No. I, I think it's, it addresses what we've been pointing at. I will say that I do have a concern that when a building inspector is is attempting to get to the site to do a building inspection, will he be trespassing in order to do it? And that's why I think that we do have to ask the question, whose land are you gonna be crossing? And so Will, do you feel like that would be mitigated through the builder's affidavit of him signing or them signing their application, permit application with you saying that they are, they are basically attesting that they have legal access but not having to prove it because i'm worried about them like having to prove it to you piece involving you in that determination well i i i don't know heather <laughs> I, so I, I think I'd like, I'd like to say it would but i don't know that it would i think this might go a little bit more to kind of you know some of those peripheral um, activities and processes that we do to go in to support the land development code at times and so i think that code of conduct that affidavit um, if we were to feel uncomfortable about that access we could ask for a third party qualified inspector to do the inspections and be hired by that individual instead of um, allowing our contracted party to do that so i think that we've talked about having that op opportunity available to us. If we're in a situation where our uh, building inspector, these are his, his plates too full and these rural remote inspections are beyond um, his workload, that we might be able to utilize it, um, a third party inspector in those cases, um, and disclose that to the applicant at the time of application or in a situation where we feel as though we have a question about our legal access. Yeah, that makes sense. Me too. Any other thoughts or concerns on this one? That particular issue we discuss a little bit further down the list here. Okay. Um, okay, so here were other things. So we'll kind of just go through each one as others. Um, so Paul brought up uh, that, sorry, I'm trying to remember, oh, energy code, um, what have you, but I think we talked about this a little bit before that we're just going to point to um, that they would have to meet a code. We're not getting involved in, in this as far as the, the zoning code. We're not getting involved in building code. Um, Okay, and then this was where you talked about your qualified person. Um, allowing the backcountry builder to employ their own inspector. You feel good about moving on from that, Paul? I do. Okay. Um, and then uh, Commissioner Munch had um, a few here that we'll kind of go through. Um, the first one uh, I think was, it, it touched on a few things we already talked about tonight, but just um, convening the Board of County Commissioners, Building and Land Use, um, Board of Health, Environmental Health, and FIRE to be sure that they agree on exceptions and any intent that may affect how typical rules and regs are implemented. Um, things like accepting the variance for wastewater, developing gray water and composting, um, that fire suppression is not available in those areas, um, but those people could choose to clear trees or not. Um, I think we've kind of addressed that, both of those up above. Um, and I don't know what the CUP 
is of surrounding property owners under that. Um, I think that heading. Sarah might be suggesting that anybody that applies for a backcountry cabin that um, similar to a CUP, we notify surrounding property owners. Oh. Uh, um, and I think that's what she's saying. Um, okay. So I think we addressed her first couple here. Um, the last one, I don't know if anybody has any strong opinions about that. I feel like that sounds really, really onerous um, that every time somebody wants to build a backcountry structure or anything, getting any kind of variances that they would have to notify all the property owners around them and do a CUP hearing. Yeah, I agree. Well, and, and I'm wondering about um, the legality of having to notify adjacent property owners to pull a building permit and, you know, for an allowable use within a certain zone district. It just, it seems, yeah, it seems to be a little bit in conflict. If it's not a conditional use permit process, then why would you have to go through the notice process? It just yeah, seems Good point, Ann. That's well, and it could be because she did have this next one here where uh, I think she's still um, a little on the fence as to doing a whole zone change instead of just changing some things in the table of uses. Um, I think, I mean, I feel like we've talked this one kind of kind of to death is that I don't, I don't think it's possible to do that. Um, personally, I think that there's it would be really difficult to identify these areas, for instance, of ag's, ag forestry that we deem backcountry um, and apply something different to other ag forestry zoned property. I don't know, I just, um, like I said, I, I feel like we've talked about this a lot, but what are other people's thoughts on, does anybody we, have We any can't thoughts? do that. Legally, we can't do that. It, um, if, in, if you allow for something in a particular zone district, you have to allow it or disallow it throughout the entire zone district. You can't sort of have different areas of the same zone district require different review procedures, which is yeah. why we're doing a backcountry zone district in the first place. Um, the next one was about rentals. Um, Is it necessary to restrict rentals? Um, the only thing I'm thinking she's talking about here, because I think the only thing we're restricting is short-term rentals, um, which I'm still pretty strongly for us restricting short-term rentals in the back country, no matter what. I don't care if they go through a CUP process or not. I just feel like we don't need a, a family of Texans who haven't never been up here to travel up on these roads away from search and rescue and stay in a backcountry cabin. Um, so that's my own thoughts on that, but I don't know if anybody else has any thoughts about they'd like to see us allow rental use in the backcountry. I think it would be silly for us to allow for rentals. Yeah, I, I think it's in complete contact, um, uh, conflict with the intent that's outlined within the definition of the district. And just for clarification, um, We do, we don't have anything that says you can't rent it at all, right? Like, so if somebody wanted to be like, oh, well, my buddy's gonna live there for the next two years or live there for six months. I mean, as long as they're meeting their building code for that, we don't have anything that restricts that. It, unless it is a pit privy, then they're only allowed right. to Right, they're restricted by that. But I just mean, our code doesn't talk, point to anything about rentals. No. Other than short term. Long term. Yeah. Uh, is there anybody who wants to see allowing short-term rentals or consideration thereof? Okay. Um, she put in here that she would like to see us only allow temporary structures. Um, so uh, if you remember, we have the backcountry structure is up to 600 square feet and then 600 to 1200 is what we have outlined right now as our you'd have to meet regular building code and that would be your dwelling, single family dwelling unit. Um, I think she's saying only the temporary structures and you give examples of those structures. Um, 
and waived variances um, focus the efforts then to just those who want permitted access. Um, it would limit trail and road construction. Um, decking and minimum foundations may be necessary depending on the structure. Um, and then a CUP process could be available for certain proposed uses. Um, I mean, I understand, you know, the, the idea of it would focus that area only to be for those looking for primitive access and it would limit your road and trail construction. I think I just would be concerned about taking away that big of a right from those property owners. I mean, we're already limiting them down to 1200. I would be pretty concerned with saying now you also can't build anything permanent um, of any kind of permanent nature um, up to standard, you know, single family dwelling code. What are, mm -hmm. anybody else have any thoughts on that? Temporary according to the building code is six months. Uh -huh. And um, so I, I don't think that Sarah knows that well, uh, maybe she's just talking about backcountry structures. That's what I think she's doing, because I think yeah. a backcountry structure is not intended to be temporary. And I think the limited access kind of, I thought, you know, we had spoken to it kind of uh, really like the likelihood of someone actually building a single family home and being able to, I guess, because of access is pretty, pretty limited. Um, yeah, and, and to that point, I think, because we're limiting that square footage to 1200, uh, I think that really makes it a lot more permanent, keeps it a lot more primitive. Um, you know, I was talking to somebody the other day and just to help like further this cause a little bit, um, there's hardly any buildable lots for sale right now um, that, that people can find. And so when they see a mining claim get listed, you know, for $60,000, $70,000, it's 10 acres, they're super excited about it. Um, and then you start telling them about the roads and how difficult it is to get there and that they're only passable in the winter, uh, or I mean, I'm in the summer. Um, their, their mind immediately goes to, well, if I'm not paying $200,000 or $300,000 for that lot anymore, because that's how much a lot that has full access and utility infrastructure, then I can spend that money on building up the access. So can I do that? Now, typically nobody's gonna do that and spend $300,000 on a lot to build a thousand square foot house, right? But they would do it for 3000 square feet house or whatever. So I'm hoping that like limiting that square footage number, um, to 1200, you know, dissuades, and then this code, you know, would kind of dissuade that from happening. But that's kind of where we're at right now, as far as the real estate market, people are looking to develop those kinds of parcels, because they're like, well, I can make up the difference in how much I pay for the lot and use that money towards improvements to get to it. Um, so I think it's, it's pretty, it's pretty key to have that top and um, maximum square footage. I think right now what we've been hearing is a lot of support from current backcountry owners. And I think taking away the 1200 square foot building right is gonna take away their support too. I think then we'll get a lot of pushback on that. I agree. Any other thoughts on that one? I agree with you, Heather, and you, Bryce. Um. If a well permit's applicable, they can dig a well and have a hand pump for summer and seasonal use. Um, within the, AUG, the Lake County AUG boundary, they could submit an application for augmentation for summer use, but no running water and no pressurized plumbing. Um, again, I feel like if you're doing a backcountry structure, you're probably not drilling a well. Um, if you are drilling a well, I don't, I guess I don't know why we would be, be as worried about pressurized plumbing and running water. I would think that, I mean, there would be no other reason to drill a well. Um, I'm not sure, I'm not sure what the, the thought was on that. So we'll have to get with her on that one. Yeah, I don't, I don't think that if a well permit is issued by the Division of Water Resources, 
I don't think we ultimately care whether it's pressurized or a hand pump. Um, and I don't think the Division of Water Resources would care either. But if somebody is going to build a thousand square foot house and, and they want a flushing toilet, they're going to have to actually have a septic system, which is going to require pressurized plumbing. Mm -hmm. So I, I think that we have discouragements built into this code, but we're not making it hard and fast law. Right, I, I think the intent of it is to gently um, change the zone district because I think the immediate um, concern from anyone and I would share that concern is you are rezoning my property and, and what are you taking away from me? So I think the intent is to gently do that and not look to be overly uh, or, or to um, be perceived as a taking. And so it, it is, you know, kind of a general method by which to do it with really the only restriction coming on board for the 1200 square feet. So if you want to build a home in this area and you can meet all of the requirements to, to do a single family detached home, you're gonna have to have running water and, and pressurized plumbing in order to do that. So I think we just have to be a little bit careful in thinking about, you know, that approach too. So this may be just directed only at, um, that country holds, but it's just, you know, just so that may not apply in this case, but. Um, similar uh, solar, solar powered only um, and uh, no direct connection to Excel main infrastructure. I don't know how possible that is in most of those areas anyway. Um, I think everybody would be looking to be off the grid, solar powered or generator. Um, and I know we've talked before, this group has talked before about uh, generator use and whether it should or shouldn't be allowed. Um, I think even Bryce brought up that there's some generators now that are pretty darn quiet. Um, I think my my first inkling is uh, similar to Anne's and that like, let's just do this easy to start with and um, if there are some things that we need to come in and amend, I feel like that's much easier to amend um, rather than just try to foresee every, every potential issue that could come up that may not even be an issue. So um, what are, does anybody else have any thoughts on that? Or I agree with you, Heather, about that. I think that it's not likely anybody's going to connect to Excel, but if they do, they'll have to get easements from the source of um, electricity in the first place. And I think bringing electricity in from somewhere else, I think could prove to be very, very expensive. Right. Well, and just to remind everyone where we landed on the standard is that generators are discouraged. However, if, you know, if they're present, then they have to be within um, uh, a structure to mitigate noise. So we didn't, you know, there was, we had a lot of discussion about to allow them or not to allow them, but as Bryce kind of educated us and I think some other folks that were on the call, um, you know, there are a lot of different options out there that, that may make sense and aren't, don't have huge impacts. Um, so we, we didn't state that we encouraged them. We actually said we discouraged them, but if they were present to be mindful of sound mitigation. I've got a question for Bryce. Um, up there on the, on the Bear Lake Road, there's several structures in there on, on um, recreation mining claims. And they excel the power line goes right through there. And if I, if I, I, I think that a couple of those cabins up there are hooked up to Excel. Do you know, Bryce? I don't know off the top of my head if they are hooked up, but I know they go, you know, the power line passes through their property. Um, but I couldn't tell you if they're hooked up directly or not. So I, I don't I don't think I would want to see no direct connection at all because it may be possible if you have the power lines that close and if you can afford to do it. Yeah, it's almost like the power lines are either going through your property or the cost is going to be so prohibitive to doing it that. Wow. 
why would you do it instead of a solar given the technology we have now? And back to the size of structures we're talking about, you know, paying $100,000 to pull Excel won't make sense for a thousand square foot house. So versus solar. You know, Howard, when I first started to hear you talk about a recreational mining claim, my first thought, and this was back when I first started here six plus years ago, that what the hell is a recreational mining claim? How is it possible that mining could be recreational? Um, I, I understand now, but it took me several years to figure that out. Well, we didn't know what else to call them. <laughs> they were mining claims and people were recreating. So what the hell, recreation yeah. mining claim. <laughs> That's a good one, Paul. Uh, and the last one here was about property marking and fencing, um, only for purposes of delineating boundaries to avoid user conflict, et cetera, should be minimal. Um, yeah, I actually, and I don't know what, what if we do at all point to fencing in, the, in, our, in our code right now, I just can't remember, but, um, I definitely don't want to see fencing the whole boundaries. I think you can mark your boundaries um, as far as the marking goes. Um, but I think fences should be strongly discouraged unless it's for like the sake of keeping your dog in a dog run or, you know, something minimal. Um, so I don't know if we want to say discouraged or if we actually want to say not allowed. I don't know. What are people's thoughts on fencing? Um, Heather, do you mind me just giving you what the draft says real quick? Because yeah. uh, we do talk about it. It says, while permanent fencing is discouraged, wildlife friendly fencing may be considered. The site plan shall include the location and design of all propo proposed fencing. It sounds good to me. So I actually brought this up to Sarah because I had a point where a lot of these mining claims are in areas that are kind of adjacent to public lands. And so, for instance, my mining claim, for a long time, the boundaries were totally forgotten and people started camping on the actual mining claim, you know, and so they kind of took it over, it became dispersed camping. And so I didn't go up and make fencing, but I put in a piece of barbed wire to delineate the line. You know, I still want to be able to, my dog can walk under it, the deer can go past it, but I think property delineation is really important, especially in these areas that have kind of been, I don't know, not really used that much for the last hundred years. Do we feel like the um, language that we have currently kind of fixes that a little bit? Like you could, you could put that on a site plan of what you're planning to do to delineate those lines. And does that kind of, does our current language, do you feel like that addresses it okay? I think it looks good. I think the wildlife friendly aspect is kind of clear. It makes it clear that it can't be a solid cedar fence. Yeah. Okay. Um, so that was kind of the end of our, of our list here. But are, is there anything else that's come up on people's minds since since then or now um, that we feel like we want to talk about and or address um, before I let Anne talk about kind of what the plan would, what the workload slash work plan would be to move this forward. Everybody's good. And obviously this isn't the end all, like this isn't final draft, sorry, all decisions are ended tonight. But I think this lets us know kind of if there are any adjustments we need to tweak before moving forward. So. Um, okay, Anne, do you want to go to the um, work plan load, workload document? Do you want me to let you share screen? And do you think that you might be able to, what, once we get this written, written up as of today, could we share it with everybody, including Chris Floyd? Yep. Okay.
Okay, can everybody see that okay? Um, so I just did kind of um, the workflow and kind of talk about where we're at and there's some talking points in here for sure. Um, so the first little part is um, getting the recommendation preparation done. So um, to, before I kind of dive in here, I think um, what I'm seeing kind of as a vision and goal, um, and it can certainly be dialed in by everyone, is that um, by uh, next, our next uh, regular meeting would be a work session where, like Paul says, we're going to take tonight um, and I'm going to, you know, look for any places that um, I need to modify the draft a bit, send out the draft, send out the response um, that uh, we all vetted tonight and just kind of make a whole packet to just kind of make sure we've got our final recommendation ready to take um, to the Board of County Commissioners on um, May 17th. And in preparation for that, so we'd have one work session um, where I would make sure that, that everything that I have ready is what um, the Planning Commission feels good about taking to the Board of County Commissioners, asking for um, the ability to, to move into the, the application, into the code amendment. Um, so the initial staff duties to get to that recommendation point of May 17th would, and I estimate that's gonna take three weeks time um, from tonight. Um, so code revision finalization, so that's taking everything that we talked about tonight. Um, and I've already identified um, just a couple things that I have to clean up in the code, um, specifically around camping allowances. There's a couple places that I had a little bit of, um, that I reviewed and I have a little um, cleanup work to do. So code um, finalization, then modify the uh, draft to reflect any of the decision outcomes tonight. Uh, research any of the remaining discussion outcomes. So anything that we talked about tonight that um, we might want to follow up on. Um, I've taken some notes and, and Heather's taken notes. And so just making sure that um, everything that we talked about tonight, we put together um, in preparation for the next work session. And so that would result in a final draft um, at the next work session, which I should have put down on there, which would be um, uh, May 10th and then deliver the recommendation to the board on May 17th. So I anticipate that will take three weeks um, between now and then to have those action steps taken care of. And then the code amendment process is the land use application that we would be doing. Code requires a 30 day published notice and a 15 day mailed notice um, on any code amendment. That's the um, required uh, time frame. I'm going to propose, and I would love to have everyone's feedback, but given the degree of exposure, um, I think that mail notices should be sent 30 plus days, maybe even, I, I would say making this process more a 60 to 90 day process um, sounds more logical because of the amount of impact. Um, I think it's good to consider that this will be the largest zone change that, that I can't find evidence of, of a larger one. There was the commercial industrial um, rezone, a large, a lot, uh, I think all of that, maybe Heather can um, help me on that. I think that was all county property though. Um, so that was fairly easy lift. Um, there was also a rezone to RUR. And again, that was um, project specific. It wasn't reaching out to public or to private landowners and saying, we're going, going to rezone you. So I just think it's good to um, know ahead of time that I think that at even 60 to 90 days, I'd love to hear a consensus about if that feels like a reasonable amount of time, um, or if we should make that even more generous. Um, and and that we, I think we have to expect that people are going to be very surprised and, and want resources and information right away. And so that's really where I think that um, staff is going to be looking for the planning commission support through this is the marketing piece and the, and the public support piece, because I think it's going to be incredibly um, a big reaction. 
And so the more informed that we can make everyone at the very start of this, um, it'll be much easier for staff to have those tools to point to. The website, um, quick, um, you know, the notices should include the fact sheet and the marketing piece. And um, just making sure that every, everyone that's going to be notified, which is close to 3,000 people, I think, um, definitely have great immediate information because their reaction could be a little panicky. Um, so um, planning commission assistance would be in the marketing, the development of it, um, designing the informational FAQ. And I would say that immediate upon approval of the recommendation um, from the planning uh, from the board and maybe even beforehand, um, that design um, FAQ should start and, and um, Heather and Aaron and I, especially Aaron and Heather, worked on this just a little bit already, um, but that'll definitely be something staff will be looking for support on. Uh, website, uh, design the website information, our internal um, IT director, uh, Amit, will definitely, I'm sure, help with this, but just, you know, maybe it'll be uploading um, for creating the uploads uh, for the website. So the whole marketing piece uh, is definitely something that uh, staff would be looking for the support of the planning commission. The public notification um, has a couple different pieces, determine the buffer. So that's on both the planning commission and then staff duty. So we will verify with um, the aid of Bryce um, that we have that buffer accurate. And, and I can't tell you, we, we did this notification um, uh, area without Bryce <laughs> and it took us forever. And Bryce did it like, made it look like we were kindergarten students at it. So <laughs> thank you Bryce for helping us so much. I, I can't tell you how much it's gonna help um, for him to help us um, identify those folks. And then we're gonna need help preparing the mailed notices. So that's literally stuffing envelopes. Um, and I would imagine that's gonna take a couple days to do. Maybe two days is ambitious. Maybe it'll take a little longer. I, I really don't have any basis of, of knowing that. And then on our side, we'll create the notices and uh, publish the notice. So that's just a matter of a couple hours. Um, that's really no big deal. On um, the other thing that we're gonna be looking for the planning commission to help with is the community outreach and engagement. Um, ideas on that, like how do we increase public awareness of what's happening and get good information out to the public. So definitely the website, um, the information that we mail out to them. Um, I'd love to hear from the Planning Commission what other uh, methods you think would be useful. I don't know if some kind of public meeting ahead of the public hearing would be beneficial or not. Um, just a suggestion, but um, love to hear ideas. And then staff preparation for the public hearing is basically the staff report. And obviously, as everyone knows, um, and I provided Heather with, I've got a very robust um, drive of all kinds of, of history and information and vetting um, that's been done. So the staff report, um, it will be an, a matter of hours for staff, maybe a couple of days actually. Um, uh, this adds another process to the existing amendment. Oh, and, and so then um, just talking about site plan review. So I think we also had to, we need, to, in all fairness, we need to make sure that everyone's aware of um, the other step that this um, introduces into our department and for our land use staff. And that is that we will now have a new site plan review. Um, so we have a new process that we'll be administering um, as we've been talking about tonight. And so I estimate that this new process um, will be a 30 to 60 day review process in order to engage with external um, agencies when needed. Um, and these are always kind of ballparks. We have to look at processes on a case-by-case -case basis and staff capacity at the time. But um, once we actually have, you know, if the code amendment is successful and we're looking to administer it, then the next piece for staff will be the actual um, processing of, of site plan reviews. And so that's the estimate that I think that we're at. 
I think it's noteworthy that currently a building permit to build in rural remote areas takes a greater de degree of review than an application in a platted subdivision or in a more accessible area. So we um, currently do a zoning review on every building permit, but now we'll have a site plan review associated with every backcountry build. So um, I don't think though that um, this will result in um, the idea that we've created a lot more work for staff, although um, certainly there is any new process is, is gonna result in, in additional work. Um, but I do think like um, Heather used the example of when people, when the scarcity of land is like it is, people are going to eventually say, well, I'll buy that $60,000 mining claim and I'll put $100,000 into making the access or $200,000 into the access. And then we're going to have to review those. So I, I think that um, it may increase um, some building permits, but those building permits are gonna come in regardless. So. I think that's all I have for you. I tried to put it um, quickly, put this in the spreadsheet today and that didn't happen. So um, that'll be down the road and before I take it to the board. So happy to answer any questions anybody might have. Did we actually decide that this is gonna be a, another site plan review? Yes. Um, yeah, this is an admitted that that's the whole way that the code is written, a backcountry build. Um, results in a site plan review. Every every backcountry build. Thank okay. you, Anne. This is super helpful. I think for letting us see kind of what uh, we can help with and what the process is going to look like moving forward. Um, just quick, a couple ideas I have as far as community engagement outreach. I like the idea of perhaps a community meeting that's just like an FAQ, like we give a little bit of information and then we just try to answer questions for folks um, outside of the, because we're going to do that anyway, right? We're going to do that at the public hearing anyway. So if we can address a lot of them ahead of time, I think that's a great idea. Um, and then possibly seeing if the Herald or, you know, level today or somebody wants to do just a quick little, hey, this is what just in form of transparency, you know, that this is what the county is working on um, and why, you know, I'm happy to, to, to chat about that further. Um, but uh, what are everybody else's thoughts? And I guess specifically, I know that this staff, especially staff time on here was a concern for commissioners. Um, how is everybody feeling about the looks of this process in moving this forward? Um, Heather, this is, I, I think that's a good question to ask, and I am a little bit concerned that uh, we did decide that every uh, backcountry build will require a site plan review procedure. And for those of you planning commissioners and com county commissioners that don't know, a site plan review only goes to the planning commission. Um, could could this be administrative? Well, it's written to be administrative. We, we kind of um, went into that discussion and, and our hope was that we wouldn't bring these to the planning commission. Um, we, and we did get buy-in from both um, the board and the planning commission that they were fine with this being an administrative process. So then why are we talking about a site plan review? It's an administrative site plan review done by staff. It's like a building permit. It's outlined as a site plan review in the code. It's a process that's outlined that's with, submittal, process. with submittal requirements and a fee. Site like plan review? Right. Plan review is building plans and construction documents. And so this is site plan review. And, it, and, and so the, the uh, draft code codifies it, makes it a process, and gives it a fee. Site plan review is a separate fee. Do we charge that as well? Yes, correct. I might also think that, uh, how many of you actually read the legal notices when they get published in the paper? And, and hey, knowing I already do. what your answer, you know, your answer is, I would suggest that we do a couple of display ads. 
I mean, or a letter to the editor too, just to see if they'd. Yeah, I think that Heather was suggesting that we see if we can get the uh, the paper on board to do actually do an article. I see they're on this meeting now, so hopefully yeah. they hear us. Yeah, Chris, I read the notices too. <laughs> I don't read the whole thing. I make sure it's not. <laughs> um, I study. I can edit a video. I don't know if that's helpful. We want to put together a little video that can be shared around. Mm -hmm. Be cool. That's a good idea. Boy, that could be that could be complicated. Not I if like... you have the right person working on it. That would be awesome, Erin. If we could have a video that was on the website, that would be amazing. Yeah, I'm not a fantastic editor I could do a graphical thing but it would be pretty amateur so if we wanted to go the route of only voiceover but if we had someone who was willing to kind of do a fact sheet like quick fact check um, and stand on camera it would be a really simple edit and we can do intros and everything so I also like having a community information meeting because so we can do that before the notice timing is up for the meeting, you know, as far as whenever our scheduled meeting is, we could do that informational night, whatever works in the schedule before that. And then know that we're probably gonna have many, many questions and answers again, public hearing night, but at least we will have um, answered a lot of questions. Yeah. How, how do you all take public comment now um, I'm, I'm, like, is it just um, directed towards staff or, and then summarized or how does that? So, That's it. Oh, go, ahead. go ahead, Ann. You know, um, in the, in the, in prior to COVID, we did have a sign up sheet and, um, Heather facilitates public comment. Um, we have yet, we were, we were in the midst of preparing for Angel View when they decided to uh, table their application um, to do it differently. And so this, this time, that's a really good point, is that we will encourage um, sign up ahead of time. Um, and I think that um, we also, in the opening statement chair, uh, uh, opening statement, <laughs> um, yeah, there's really good too about reiterating like if you have a different perspective that hasn't already been shared, um, you know, that, that you may want to go ahead and speak up. But she's amazing at kind of making sure because on some of these, um, when we have a lot of people speaking, it's, it's kind of nice to kind of keep reiterating if, if there's a, a new perspective or something um, your concern hasn't already been um, shared. But I'm going to add that over here to um, sign up ahead of time. Thanks, Abby. So we would have them, um, there's a, basically, usually what we do is we have staff report, um, or I'm sorry, we'll open up the public hearing staff report um, presentation, you know, on what we're, what we're trying to do. Um, we kind of open it up first to questions, um, you know, because in a normal application, it's not us as the applicants, you know, it would be somebody, Angel View, whoever. Um, so then it would be time for commissioner and planning commissions, uh, questions, Q and a with the, with the applicant. And then we open it up to public comment and I just go through a list, um, of people. So if we do it on zoom, it'll be, um, you know, a list of people who signed up. And then obviously if they go into direct chat with, and throughout the meeting, they can add themselves to that list. And typically if there are questions within that, we're taking notes of those questions and we're not answering them necessarily at the same time as those public comment. A lot of times we get all the way through all of the public comment and then we go back and address any questions that were brought up. Um, and unless there's one that just like keeps recurring that seems to be, uh, you know, every once in a while you'll have people that are completely misunderstanding how something is. So sometimes we'll jump in and clarify that, but typically we take all public comment and questions and then we go back and try to address those. Um, to avoid the whole argument happening between public and 
and planning commission. So that's kind of the process um, from there, uh, if that helps answer your question. Yeah, I think, um, you know, doing a, kind of an information night, maybe there's something that we can put out there that's a, just a bit more informal to, yeah. to be able to pose questions to an email address or, um, and then, and then certainly during that educating, yeah, like on how to actually submit comment for the actual hearing. Yeah, I think that's a great idea. I think for the Q and A night, it can be more of a ask a question and we'll directly answer it and then move on to the next. Um, and then for public hearing, we, yeah, handle it the, the other way. Yeah, I like that. I, so I just wanted to chime in on that earlier question. Um, just as at least as one commissioner, I feel pretty good that we're close enough that that timeline seems realistic. And my concern about sort of this dragging out and sort of sucking, a, you know, months and months and months of staff and PC time, you know, I feel pretty good that we can get this, get this done, you know, on that, like the outline that Anne gave seemed good to me. So just one, one commissioner's viewpoint on that question. Awesome. Thank you, Jeff. And also, I wanted to chime in on the, um, the, I think, Anne, sorry, my phone was cutting in and out for a second, but it sounded like there were like a lot of people who need to get notified um, and definitely encourage us to look at contacting a mail house rather than like doing this in-house. I mean, they're really, really quick and efficient and inexpensive to do mass mailings. Um, if we can give them the... Um, you know, address list and the contents, it just, it just magically happens. So let us, let us not all volunteer our time to stuff envelopes. I didn't know about that. That sounds awesome. <laughs> oh my God, happy birthday, Aaron. Why are you here? Thank you happy for- Happy birthday. Yeah, happy birthday. Night. Sorry, guys, I just got to leave, but thank you. Um, thank you for being here. I'll talk to you later. Thanks. Bye. Happy birthday. Well, thank you, Anne, for putting this together. Uh, like I said, it's super helpful. Um, and maybe once we uh, fine tune that document I just had up, we can just send both of these out together to everybody here tonight. Um, so that everybody has this kind of idea in their head. And then uh, a few of us can, I know that uh, Aaron and I can keep moving forward on the informational FAQ so that that can be ready in the meantime. Um, so we'll keep plugging away on that. And then I guess I would just urge you to um, please reach out to us on the planning commission if there's something you feel like somebody can help with or hey, I need, three of you to do X, you know, or we need this design website stuff done, who can do it, you know, please feel free to delegate stuff out to us. I think everybody's willing to, to put in some effort. So we really appreciate the amount of time you've put into, to putting this stuff together. Does anybody else have any final thoughts and or suggestions or concerns or anything this evening. Okay, well, I feel like it's been super productive. Thank you all for participating and um, I'm excited. I feel like this workflow plan helps make it seem so real now. It's exciting. Well, um, Heather, I just wanted to add quickly, just for in terms of transparency, I know that we have a large Spanish speaking community, although I don't know how many are Spanish speaking owners out in the back country, I could do a lot of the translation. Um, I have interpreted a lot in, in the school district. I do help work with uh, uh, Craig with uh, translating for the mineral belt. And so I'm, I'm more than willing to step in in that, in that sense and just help out in, in any way that I can. I would love that. I think that if we can just plan on putting anything marketing that we have in front of you to help translate, I think that I think we should have that on the website. I think anything we get sent out should be both. So I 
that's awesome. Thank you. That'd be super helpful. Thank you for bringing that up. Thank you, Heather. Anything else? Cool. Well, thank you again, everybody, for participating. Do I have a motion to adjourn? I'll go ahead and move that we adjourn this meeting. <laughs> Can I get a second, second. please? Awesome. All in favor. Hi. Bye. Bye. Thank you all. Have a really good evening. Bye. Have a good night.